Hey everyone, it's Brooke, and it's like a Christmas miracle where I show up after being disappeared for a long time, many months. Um, it's not it's not really Christmas, nor really a miracle. I'm just back. Uh, I've gotten into this pattern of like book tubing for eight months and then disappearing for four. It's like just my natural state of being apparently and it works well and I recommend it actually a lot. Take breaks. Um, okay, so I'm gonna jump back in, not with like a recap of where I've been or what I've read or whatever. If you wanna know what I've read, it's all on Goodreads and you should check it out there. Otherwise, I'm just gonna start with a June wrap up. Um, the first thing on the stack, because I just have them stacked and we're just gonna go in that order is the faster I walk the smaller I am by this lovely person whose name I'm going to butcher because I'm not Norwegian and it is translated by Carrie A. Pierce. This is the book I read most recently for the my my project annotate that I do where we just have like a mail chain and we mail books to each other and we 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 you know annotate them and we send it on to the next person. Yeah, it's um, a lot of fun. This book in particular is about a woman. It's a very internal novel. Like, you're very much in her brain. And she's older. I mean, elderly. Death is not something that is some faraway thing. She's starting to really think about the end of her life. And kind of look back on the life that she didn't live. She's been very much sort of reclusive and like a hermit, um, doesn't really interact with too many other people besides her husband. And at this point in her life, the only place she ever really goes is like the grocery store. And so you're getting a lot of just her kind of thinking back over that and trying to make some more uh, or make decisions about things she wants to do before she dies and getting out trying to live a little bit more. And it's kind of really bizarre. Uh, she's a very kind of bitter uh, negative, cynical lady, as you might expect. Um, and some of the things she has to sort of face about herself or truths that she has to kind of stare down made me uncomfortable because I think, I think very similarly a lot of the times. And so there are moments that it really felt like holding up a mirror to my ugliest self. And so it was an awkward reading experience in that way. Um, uh, I think I gave it like three, three and a half stars out of five. I'm not sure why I didn't give it more. I think maybe it just, it was short. I mean, it's really short. I think it didn't necessarily, I don't think five years from now I'll be remembering this that well, but it was definitely worth it just for the self-reflection I had to go through as I, as I read this. Um, a comic I read this month was the first volume of Paper Girls by Brian K. Vaughan with art by Cliff Chang. This, I started reading as singles when uh, it started coming out. I think I read the first three issues and this collects the first five. So it's like a sort of reread for me. But this story takes place in the late 80s in a suburb in the U.S. I don't remember what city exactly. Um, it's 1988. <laughs> and it's the the morning after Halloween, and this group of like 11, 12 year old paper girls um, are out in their neighborhood delivering papers when strange things start to happen. I'm not going to get too much more into kind of the details of that. It's very kind of science fiction driven. There's some time travel, some other people <laughs> elements um, that are going on, but just a lot of questions are raised in this. The art is beautiful. I love Cliff, Ch Cliff Chang's art. I love what he did on Brian Azzarello's Wonder Woman. And so this is very, I don't know, it has such a great 80s vibe to it, I feel like. I feel like it's just sort of, it just really fits the story very well. I think this, the first issue in this is maybe the best first issue I've ever read. It was so exciting when it came out. I remember everyone was like, oh my gosh, this is so perfect. I mean, um, Brian K. Vaughn has a lot to live up to now that he's kind of the saga guy. But it was so good. And I'm not sure that the first volume, the first story arc, lived up to it. It just, it's interesting and it's intriguing, but there's so much going on and there's so much 
world building and setup in this first volume and so many questions raised and like no answers. And I feel like with all that going on, it was hard to connect with characters. There's not too much character development. So I think it's a series that hopefully will get a little bit more fleshed out as time goes on, as the volumes continue to come out and that we get to know the characters better and that I care more about them and so that I care more about the story. Because I think one of the great things about Saga that Brian K. Vaughn did is that you you just sort of immediately care about Alana and Marco and Hazel. Like, it's immediate. And I didn't feel that here. And I think that's what's lacking for me. Um, so I think this was a three out of five star read. I was in the mood for some nonfiction. So I picked up Sarah Vowell's Lafayette. Lafayette. <laughs> okay. I can't even say his name normally anymore. Lafayette in the somewhat United States. This is... Sarah Vowell's typical thing where she takes some part of history, typically American history, and she kind of focuses in on it. And this um, is following the Marquis de Lafayette, who was a Frenchman, but he came over when he was 19 to fight beside his American brothers in the American Revolution uh, in the 1700s. And he became like this American hero, you guys. Like he's, he's, he's buried in France, but he's buried in dirt from Bunker Hill pretty sure. That's insane. Um, <laughs> but it's it, it was really good. Yes, I was sort of half inspired by Hamilton the Musical because Lafayette is, is quite the character in that. Um, but um, I've had this on my shelves and I love Sarah Bell. She just, she has such a great voice to her history. It's so, I mean, there's the history parts and then there's this like part travelogue part where you go on her through her like research journeys and she'll just tell you little bits and bobs about weird people she meets and all kinds of things and it's not history that she sort of you know sometimes history you can kind of feel a distance to like it's just sort of you know facts about this event she puts a lot of personality into it she has an opinion about history she's not some kind of omniscient uh, objective third party. She has an opinion. She will leave snarky comments when she agrees or disagrees with someone in history. And I just really love the voice that she writes with so much. And I will read anything and everything she writes. She makes any topic interesting. And um, yeah, she just does such a great job. Continuing the nonfiction theme, I picked up John Krakauer's Missoula Rape and the Justice System in a small, or in a college town, not a small college town, although it's fairly small. Uh, this is a hard read. It focuses on Missoula, Montana, where the University of Montana is during sort of this rape crisis they had uh, from, from like 2010 to 2012, where there was just a lot of rape cases being brought forward and like the Department of Justice and stuff were investigating their police department and their like state agencies and how they dealt with those rape cases. The college was being investigated. Um, it was just a hullabaloo about a very terrible thing happening. And what John Krakauer does here is he focuses on the Missoula incidences, but he lets you know that in all honesty, what was happening at Missoula was happening on every college campus of a similar size in America. It was not, it was being called like the rape capital of the country and it, it wasn't. And that's the really sad part. Um, this, I was a little bit trepidatious because it is a man writing about rape, um, which is largely, not entirely, I understand that, but largely a, a female issue and it's very much a female issue in this, but he does a really great job of focusing on the victims, centering the victims, and, and really telling the story through the voices of the victims. So... You know, I, he did a good job. He doesn't deserve a pat on the back for that, but he he did what he should have done. And so the first part of the book focuses on victim accounts and, like, what the girls went through and their stories. And then the latter half of the book focuses on two trials, one where there's a conviction and one where there is not. And you really get inside the justice system and the way that rape is persecuted tried or persecuted or just you know or in the in the ways that it's not the ways that it's ignored the ways that it's just mishandled um the ways it's barely uh you know just all of the terrible things about rape culture in this country and i was really inspired to read this 
once the Brock Turner stuff really kind of came to light because that case in America is about, you know, this kind of glorified swimming athlete who, yes, he gets convicted, but he, his sentence was six months after violently raping an unconscious woman. Uh, and this is very much goes into the kind of the glorified athlete and how much they get away with. Um, it was just, it was really well done. And if it's something that you think you could read, I think it's an important read. If I have criticisms of it, it's hard to say it's a criticism. This book is very narrowly focused on its victims. You know, so it doesn't really step outside the world of sort of white college girls. Um, because it's focused on these, in Missoula and Montana are very white. Um, I think the state's like 98% white. So it's very white focused. So it doesn't investigate the intersections of, of humanity and how um, that affects rape. Um, but he, he's not trying to do that. He, he, I think he understands he's not doing that. Um, and I understood he wasn't going to do that. So, uh, you know, it would be interesting if he wrote like a follow-up with, with more, with a broader, you know, victim spectrum. Uh, you know, how women of color are affected or how trans women are affected, I think could be interesting. But for what this is and what it does, I think it is very good. Another comeback I read was actually the choice for my book club, my in real life book club, and that was Lady Killer Volume 1 by Joelle Jones and Jamie S. Rich. This is a reread for me. I read it in singles when it first came out, um, and I really adore this comic, like, entirely. The art is phenomenal. It's so retro and, like, perfect for what's going on in the story. Oh, yeah, it gets a little violent. Warnings. <laughs> um, if the cover didn't give that away, uh, it's about a 1950s housewife who is also an assassin for hire. And just that kind of goes awry. And it focuses a lot on, like, work-life balance. Um, and feminist issues, and just, it makes its women characters far more interesting than the male characters, which I really like. Like, her husband is just a total doofus. We talked a lot about that at our um, discussion. He's just kind of an idiot, and she's clearly the really smart one. Um, uh, the things that he says to her, you just sort of laugh at. Uh, so I really liked that, how that's kind of turned on its head a little bit. Uh, it's action-packed. I think... It's one of those where the violence is done well. Like, the blood is not red, it's black. And that may not seem like a lot, but it really helps dial it back a little bit. I think it's definitely worth a read if it's something that sounds like you would be interested in. And then I also picked up The Invasion of the Tearling by Erica Johansson. This is the second book in her... I don't know if it has series name but it follows the queen of the tearling which i read in may this series i think has been talked about a lot it follows um a 19 year old girl named kelsey who on her birthday becomes queen of this land and she's been she's been raised in isolation so she has a lot to learn and she needs to learn it very quickly there are several people out to kill her um and it was a book i thought that was way but it's not way it's not uh um, we had a really good discussion about this in my book club as well, which was sort of surprising, but there's so many really heavy topics in this, really dark topics and really dark violence. I mean, things like sex slavery and human trafficking. Um, I think one of the interest, most interesting things, though, is that this book feels like it's set in the, like, way fantastical past. I mean, there is magic, so this is fantasy, but it, it feels like it's very medieval and feudal and, like, you know, just agrarian, um, feels very much like the Middle Ages or just, just a long time ago. And it's actually the future of our current world. Um, something happens and um, we sort of backtrack completely, get rid of technology, and, and we end up here. Uh, which is just really fascinating when she like brings up stuff from the past like Harry Potter's mentioned and whatnot. Um, the second book, I don't want to go into very much about plot. Um, it is... It is a bit of a departure because we get two major perspectives in this instead of just Kelsey's. We also get a woman named Lily who is back f during like our time, a few years in the future, but basically the, what's happening in the downfall of our age. Um, so that was sort of a little bit disconcerting at first. It felt a little disjointed. It took me a minute to get used to it because it's such a, 
a very different thing, like this kind of fantastical future land and then like the gritty now. Um, but once I got used to it, I really liked it. I thought it was a very effective storytelling method and the ending was exciting and I can't wait for the third and I believe final book that comes out in October, November. The Fate of the Tearling, I believe is what it's called. So if this series is something that you um, have been wanting to pick up, I would recommend it. I think it's one of the most feminist uh, fantasy series I've ever read and I think... There are lots of interesting characters and um, lots of interesting things. And like I said, we had a really great book club discussion about everything. And everyone's continuing on with the series. So I feel like I can give it my full recommendation. Finally, my absolute favorite book of the month. Five stars. It will be in my favorite books of the year. Absolutely. And that is... Home Going by Yaa Jesse, which I know everyone has talked about and raved about, but it is so deserving of that. I think everyone knows what it's about at this point. It follows two women in like the 1760s in Ghana, um, Fia and Essi, and they are half-sisters. They don't really know about each other. Um, one gets sold into slavery, and one basically gets sold into marriage to a British officer, and you follow... Their generations um, until present day, as and you see what happens to them, and the, and how staying in Ghana or going to America kind of affects you know their family lines, and just um, it is it is a feat of writing, it is a feat of storytelling and story crafting and narrative creation. It is just to think that this is her first book blows my fucking mind um it's it's short it's barely 300 pages each chapter which we only get one chapter with each character um is only like 20 to 25 pages and so she has to do so much in those 20 25 pages i mean she has to introduce you to the character make you care about the character sort of comment on the before character and also set up for the next generational character and she does it so well and each one has their own voice and each one you want to keep going with and you want to um i would read a novel about any of them and she brings so much humanity and the spectrum of humanity and there are deep, deep lows, and there are there are great moments of joy, and it's just, I don't know, it is just, like, technically almost a perfect novel. I it did only give this a four and a half stars because I do think there were a couple points where she would sort of, within one person's chapter, kind of switch back and forth between past, present, future, just in their own personal life, and sometimes I thought that was done a little bit sloppily because i would have to reread it to figure out is she talking about the past or is she still in the now or what's going on so there are a couple of moments like that for me but other than that this book is just phenomenal and i don't know how you could read this and not think it was amazing um and the cover is wonderful the cover is so wonderful once you you read the book and um it all makes a lot of sense <sighs> it's so good Every, what everyone says is absolutely true um i can't I don't know what she's going to write next, but I will be there first in line. Um, so that's how I'm going by y'all, Jesse. Pick it up. Okay, that was a really long video, and I'm very out of practice, and I probably said um a lot. It takes me a moment to get back into the rhythm and not doing that. Um, but it's what it is. I am, I am back, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.